Chapters 5 to 8 of De Monarchia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. De Monarchia by Dante Alighieri. Translated by Aurelia Henry Reinhardt. Book 3 Whether the authority of the Roman monarch derives from God immediately or from some vicar of God. Chapter 5 Argument from the Precedence of Levi over Judah. They also abstract an argument from the word of Moses, declaring that in Levi and Judah sprang from Jacob's loins the types of these two sovereignties the one being father of the priesthood, and the other father of temporal rulers. From this they argue, the relation of Levi to Judah is that of the church to the empire. Levi preceded Judah in birth according to scripture, therefore the church precedes the empire in authority. Refutation is here easy, for I might, as before overthrow by positive denial, the assertion that Levi and Judah the sons of Jacob, typified these sovereignties. But I will concede that point. When, however, they proceed to infer from their argument that, as Levi had precedence in birth, so has the church in authority, I repeat that the predicate of the conclusion is not the term of the major premise. For the one is authority, and the other birth, things different in subject and meaning. There is an error, therefore, in the form of the syllogism, which is as follows. A precedes B in C. D is related to E as A is to B. Therefore D precedes E in F. But F and C are dissimilar. If they become insistent, saying that F follows from C, that is, authority from birth, and that in an inference a consequent may replace an antecedent, as animal might replace man, I answer that it is untrue. Many are older in years who have no precedence in authority, but are superseded by their juniors. For instance, when bishops are younger than their arch presbyters. And so the insistence is misplaced, for they have named as cause that which is none. Chapter 6 Argument from the Election and Deposition of Saul by Samuel Moreover, they take from the first book of Kings the election and deposition of Saul, and declare that, according to the text, Saul, an enthroned king, was dethroned by Samuel executing God's command as his vicar. And they reason from this that, as the vicar of God, then had authority to give temporal power, to take it away, and to transfer it to another, so now God's vicar, high priest of the church universal, has like authority to bestow withdraw, and even to consign to another the sceptre of temporal dominion. From this would follow undoubtedly, as they claim, that the empire is a derived power. But to destroy the premise that Samuel was vicar of God, we need only reply that he was not vicar. He acted merely as a special envoy for this commission, bringing an express command from his Lord. This is evident from the fact that what God bade him, that alone he did and that alone recounted. Wherefore let it be understood that it is one thing to be a vicar, and another to be a messenger or minister, as it is one thing to be a doctor, and another to be an interpreter. Now a vicar is one to whom has been assigned jurisdiction according to law, or to his arbitrary judgment, and so within the boundaries of the jurisdiction assigned to him, he may determine legally or arbitrarily matters of which his lord has no knowledge. But an envoy, in so far as he is an envoy, cannot do so, for as the hammer operates only through the strength of the smith, so the envoy acts only through the will of the person who delegates him. Nor does it follow, though God did this when Samuel was his envoy, that the vicar of God can do it. For through his angels God has achieved is achieving, and will achieve, many things which the vicar of God, the successor of Peter, was powerless to do. Their argument is constructed from the whole to the part like this. Man can hear and see. 
therefore the eye can hear and see. However, it would hold negatively, man cannot fly, therefore the arms of man cannot fly. And in the same way, according to the belief of Agathon, God cannot through a messenger undo what has been done, therefore his vicar is unable to do so. Chapter 7 Argument from the Oblation of the Magi From the book of Matthew they also cite the oblation of the Magi, claiming that Christ accepted both frankincense and gold, in order to signify that he was lord and governor of the spiritual and temporal domains. They draw as inference from this that the vicar of Christ is lord and governor of these realms, and consequently has authority over both. In answering this, I grant the text of Matthew and their interpretation, but the inference they try to draw from it is false through a deficiency in the terms. Their syllogism is this. God is Lord of the spiritual and temporal domains. The Pope is the Vicar of God. Therefore, he is Lord of the spiritual and temporal domains. While each proposition is true, the middle term is changed to admit four terms to the argument, thereby impairing the syllogistic form. This is plain from the writings on syllogizing considered simply. For one term is God, the subject of the major premise, and the other term is Vicar of God, the predicate of the minor. And if anyone insists on the equivalence of God and Vicar, his insistence is useless, for no Vicar, divine or human, can be coordinate with his authority, as is easily seen. And we know that the successor of Peter is not co-equal with divine power, at least not in the operation of nature. He could not, by virtue of the office committed to him, make earth rise up, or fire fall. It is impossible that God should have entrusted all things to him, for God was in no way able to delegate the power of creation or of baptism, as is plainly proved despite the contrary statement of the Master in his fourth book. We know, too, that a man's deputy, in so far as he is a deputy, is not of coordinate power with him, because no one can bestow what does not belong to him. Princely authority belongs to a prince only for his employment, since no prince can authorize himself. He has power to receive and to reject it, but no power to create it in another, seeing that the creation of a prince is not effected by a prince. If this is true, it is evident that no prince can substitute for himself a regent equal in all things to himself. Wherefore, the protest is of no avail. Chapter 8. Argument from the Prerogative of the Keys Assigned to Peter From the same Gospel they quote the saying of Christ to Peter, Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And understand this saying to refer alike to all the apostles, according to the text of Matthew and John. They reason from this that the successor of Peter had been granted of God power to bind and loose all things, and then infer that he has power to loose the laws and decrees of the empire, and to bind the laws and decrees of the temporal kingdom. Were this true, their inference would be correct. But we must reply to it by making a distinction against the major premise of the syllogism which they employ. Their syllogism is this. Peter had power to bind and loose all things. The successor of Peter has like power with him. Therefore the successor of Peter has power to loose and bind all things. From this they infer that he has power to loose and bind the laws and decrees of the empire. I concede the minor premise, but the major only with distinction. Wherefore I say that all, the symbol of the universal, which is implied in whatsoever, is never distributed beyond the scope of the distributed term. When I say, all animals run, the distribution of all comprehends whatever comes under the genus animal. But when I say, all men run, the symbol of the universal only refers to whatever comes under the term man. And when I say, all grammarians run, the distribution is narrowed still further. Therefore we must always determine what it is over which the symbol of the universal is distributed. Then, from the recognized nature and scope of the distributed term, will be easily apparent 
the extent of the distribution. Now, were whatsoever to be understood absolutely, when it is said, whatsoever thou shalt bind, he would certainly have the power they claim. Nay, he would have even greater power. He would be able to loose a wife from her husband, and, while the man still lived, bind her to another, a thing he can in no wise do. He would be able to absolve me while impenitent, a thing which God himself cannot do. So it is evident that the distribution of the term under discussion is to be taken not absolutely, but relatively to something else. A consideration of the concession to which the distribution is subjoined will make manifest this related something. Christ said to Peter, I give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, that is, I will make thee doorkeeper of the kingdom of heaven. Then he adds, and whatsoever, that is, everything which, and he means thereby, everything which pertains to that office thou shalt have power to bind and loose. And thus the symbol of the universal, which is implied in whatsoever, is limited in its distribution to the prerogative of the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Understood thus, the proposition is true, but understood absolutely, it is obviously not. Therefore I conclude that although the successor of Peter has authority to bind and loose in accordance with the requirements of the prerogative granted to Peter, it does not follow, as they claim, that he has authority to bind and loose the decrees or statutes of empire, unless they prove that this also belongs to the office of the keys. But we shall demonstrate farther on that the contrary is true. End of section 9